Windrow again at the Cable Diesel with part two of a study of, guess what, water. Naturally, uh, my middle name uh, could be water. I'm drawn to it, uh, not only because of I like its texture, but I also like what happens to the top of it and underneath it, and the reflections are what make me stop my car and slam on the brakes and decide, oh, that's the one. And this one is called Bend in the Creek. It's here on the North Shore of Long Island, uh, just between the Setauket and Stony Brook, on a spit of land which is called West Meadow Beach, and uh, this creek uh, runs uh, with the tide. Uh, when it comes in, the creek is full. When the tide goes out, the creek is low. And uh, the bottom of the creek is one of those great, wonderful, oozy masses of thing, of places, in which myriads and billions of creatures live of all kinds. So uh, the bend in the creek uh, is uh, sort of poetic, but that's what I have called it for a very, very long time. And I've painted this almost for as long as I have been here in the area, which goes back some. And um, this little tiny beach in the foreground, right here, this one, is where only some very few knowing mothers come with their small children, only at high tide. At low tide, it's virtually not very pleasant. But at high tide, the water rushes in. It's clear and it's clean, and it's got a tremendous amount of pri privacy. And it's very calm, not dangerous, no big waves, and so on. So this is a haven for uh, critters that like to play in the sand uh, and uh, have access to the water without any danger. Uh, there is also a lovely growth of what um, is so uh, typical and um, indigenous to this area, those beech cedars. Also in the foreground here, that wonderful bush in the foreground, is a beech plum. And at about the right time of year, that is going to produce some rather uh, nifty berries that make beech plum jelly. Maybe unknown to a lot, but certainly not unknown to the residents who live here and who spend the month of September, uh, September making beech plum jelly from what they have gathered. Uh, these cedar trees, they are very typical. They have to be done with, with a lot of care, uh, not care, but a lot of imagination, a lot of observation, that they come to a wonderful point. They're usually bending in the wind, the tops of the trees, uh, have, a, uh, have a look about them which is uh, very typical and this is almost like painting a portrait of a human face. You have to make sure you get the features right. If you don't get the features right and it begin and it looks for a one split second like anything but what it is, uh, the recording of this scene is going to be inaccurate. So I always like to say observe. Uh, I think it was Plato that said uh, observe Remember and compare. Uh, so if you do that, if you have those three little words in the back of your mind, if you observe this, remember it, and compare it to others, you'll realize that this tree is no palm. It is no uh, great um, sequoia. It certainly isn't a maple. Uh, it can't possibly be called a willow tree. It goes in the wrong direction. Uh, what it is, is what it is. It's a cedar. And uh, native to, uh, to the shoreline of Long Island, particularly on the North Shore, there are a whole mess of them down on the South Shore too, but here in the creek they get a certain look about them. And I think that you'll see that you have to uh, observe that a lot of uh, air or, or light or sky is seen through them. Uh, it, is, um, it is a 
luxurious growth in spots, but it also has its own pattern. And so I'm doing it with care. I'm not, uh, I'm doing it with care and observation, not hoping that by whacking a lot of paint into the canvas, I'm going to get it to maybe look like that, but I want to be absolutely sure that the viewer of this painting is going to understand immediately where this place is and what's growing there. Um, it's, um, it's an obstinacy of mine in this uh, series that I'm doing of painting uh, from life uh, that I want it to be absolutely recognizable and not left to wonder, oh, so where's that place? Um, the little, the little uh, 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 pinpoints of light that you see through this tree are typical of it. And you also see uh, a kind of a suggestion of the trunk. And sometimes it's a double trunk. I believe this one has a double trunk, which uh, can, yes, it has. It's a, and that's very common. These, uh, these cedars uh, put forth two in the early stages. And if they're left alone, which of course they are, fortunately, they will have two uh, nice, sturdy trunks. They got to be sturdy, because these tree, trees take a rather handsome beating uh, in certain times of the year. At hurricane time, these cedars bend almost down and touch the ground, but they are pliable, and um, that's why they have this lovely look about them. Uh, they, um, they can withstand all sorts of things. They can even withstand my talking about them all the time. Nobody comes and worries these trees. Uh, nobody tries to climb them. They're very itchy, and uh, you don't want to get too, too near them. And uh, they certainly don't look like a Christmas tree that you could swipe and put in your house. And so they are protected by the fact that they are uh, uh, so unique and I think, uh, well, almost like a Rottweiler. You don't get close to these trees because they do, they do have some sort of nasty feeling to them. Um, however, they are picturesque, they are typical, and they are uh, my great oh, love affair with these trees started a very long time ago. The next one that I'm going to do, and, and, and see it's got one side of it that doesn't have any on it, probably from the wind coming from Long Island Sound. You see the sound is over here. And the wind has been blowing them in this direction for as long as they've been growing here. And that means that one side of this one has decided to not have any branches on it. The other one is more of a, um, of a it's got the same kind of pointy um, and uh, lacy look to it, but it's rounder. Uh, but it still has its points. The reason that the sky was put in uh, uh, and gone over the area which I designated as the tree space is because you do this in layers. You put the paint on over the background. We're using the quick drying paint helps that a great deal. It means that the paint has set by the time you're getting ready to overlay color on top of it. This is a very deep green because these uh, trees are in uh, somewhat silhouette at this point. They, uh, they're, they're not as deep a green in, um, when the sun hits them. They sometimes tend to have a rather beautiful um, uh, dusty green quality to them. But when they're in silhouette, they definitely are extremely dark. Uh, here is the uh, lacy look that you want to have in spots. And the pointy, the, the typical pointy parts of the branches up here. I'm using my, my, my small finger as an anchor, uh, as a thing on which to lean, so that I can get my, uh, my trusty, uh, nice uh, striping brush to give me the points that I need and to show you the way in which the wind is blowing. Uh, whether or not anybody is conscious of the fact that painters see this. I think that wait, if you were to get out there and see the way these um, little tiny top branches are leaning, uh, that you will understand uh, where the wind is coming from at that particular time. I've been out on this spit of land during uh, winter uh, storms and the uh, branches are going the other way because northeasters, uh, nor'easters as they call them in Maine, uh, tend to make the trees go in the wrong direction. But here is the top of this sort of rounded cedar with all its nice little really cribbly pointy typical fingers that reach up uh, and uh, make them what they are. Uh, for, uh, for the accuracy of the greenery, uh, that's probably one of the reasons that people like to acquire my paintings of Long Island because they are instantly recognizable. And I think that if you're going to bother, by golly, to sit in front of a place and paint something that you ought to be as faithful to it as you would be to the, to the recording of a human face or even somebody's animal. So uh, let's be sure that we, make, uh, that we make the things that we do 
recognizable in this style of painting. I dearly like to go off into uh, great tangents of interpretive painting sometimes and be totally abstract. I'm not very good at it, but it is great fun. However, this is not the style that I'm talking about here. And uh, stick to the style if you're, if you're intending to uh, talk about it. Uh, stick to the style and keep talking about it the same way all the time. I'm hoping one of these days to be able to have some kind of a video available. I don't know when it's for, I don't know if it's ever even possible, but I've been thinking about everything that I talk about on this program would be nice if it were in a more permanent form of a videotape. Uh, they, all the others have it, perhaps I ought to. Uh, I've been thinking about it. I've not uh, come to any conclusions yet, but um, it's in there, boiling away in my poor brain, trying to come to some uh, a conclusion about how to do it. Uh, here, is, um, here is the general, well, this is a little bit more dense up here, uh, and the only reason that I can tell you that is because I'm working from life. I would not invent this, uh, and I wouldn't know where to go if I were inventing it. So anyway, there is a sort of a good interpretation of that, of that, um, of that cedar. And over here there's a kind of a, a indistinct dark form. I don't know what it is. It's probably another smaller cedar uh, that either was broken during a storm or has not grown tall enough. But it's sort of over here in the distance making it all extremely dark down here. And I'm using some Van Dyke brown, some sap green, and a little, a little bit of my archival medium which is going to make this dry quickly for transportation. But here is the dark area of which is preparing the background for for this nicely lit um, uh, beech plum bush. I'm going beyond it because the beech plum bush has got some darkness behind it. And you'll see what I mean when I, when I talk about it. Here is this, here is this cedar tree, uh, which I'm painting uh, down to where it probably grows, but the bush is in front of it. However, I do need the darkness behind it in order to be able to paint the bush over on top of it. Uh, all of this is techniques that I try to tell you about and make clear as I go along and hopefully I kind of succeed sometimes. Um, some people that I have you know, spoken to on the phone and who write to me say that um, they get a great deal out of these programs because I do try to uh, maybe tiresomely repeat myself but in the interest of getting it, um, getting the message across. Here is the, here is the, the sunstruck top part of the beech plum uh, bush uh, that is in the foreground somewhat dominating the entire right side of this canvas. Uh, it has, it's got a little bit of uh, bluish in it. It's not a, an extremely pale green, but it is uh, definitely uh, got a lot of light uh, shining down on it. Oh gosh, I need more than that. It's almost white. It's interesting when these bushes uh, really get uh, struck by sunshine, they become extremely pale. Uh, and then the little, the little top, uh, the little top leaves are what separate it from the other, from the background. Um, uh, trees that are dark behind it. I'm using the quick drying white here in rather heavy texture. You may be able to be seeing that on the, uh, the close-up monitor and that's for uh, drama as well as um, understanding of uh, the brilliance of these, uh, of the top of this bush. Uh, it becomes dark very rapidly and um, that, be, that means that you uh, are going to come back to some of the sunstruck leaves, but it's dark as it, uh, as it, uh, as it um, uh, overlaps the water. And this little bush does not have pointy uh, um, branches and leaves the way the cedars do. It's got little stubby round ones because the foliage is different. And um, that will immediately tell you that observation is extremely important in this kind of, uh, in this kind of painting. Well, what's round and what's pointy uh, is to be kept in mind uh, uh, most of the time. Uh, the same as in anything where you're trying to record something accurately for a visual message. I'm into visual messages as you may have determined. Um, the, uh, the signal has come that I'm going to take a very short break. Uh, that's good because I need to squeeze out some more white. And as I'm working on this uh, not complex but very dense uh, need for um, texture and detail is this bush. Maybe the, uh, maybe the, uh, the feeling about the painting is this is a painting of water, but what it actually turns out to be is a painting of a bush. Uh, the water is the background for the bush. 
and I think that's what makes it quite fascinating. I'll be back very shortly and uh, we'll continue with this episode. Once again, with a very short time left to produce uh, the final, the final uh, finalizing of this composition called "Bend in the Creek." Um, now is the time for the for the technique, which uh, I find uh, is essential if you're going to be doing this kind of painting. You have to be able to master this uh, striping brush, be, and I'll show you why. Here's the here is the exact reason why. Comes now the time when these very small and very important branches uh, ha are going to be put in to give you the uh, the uh, origin and feeling of this bush. And uh, by sh by showing you the use of this, it it's going to be obvious to anybody that practice is going to be needed for this. You barely touch the canvas. It is it is such a it is such a tiny movement that. Um, you have to really practice elsewhere and I've prepared the background for this as you can see uh, there are just innumerable tiny wonderful spiky very small lacy branches that um, are part of this uh, a part of this composition as I said a few moments ago this is the portrait of a bush um, uh, I, I, I have a feeling that uh, when it's when it's done, that people will agree that the bush was worth the trouble, but it also is worth the time and the patience. There has to be a certain understanding that the patience required to do this is essential. Uh, and if people say I wouldn't have the patience, they're probably right and may may not be wanting to uh, start getting involved in this kind of thing. But here is the um, here is the need for this technique. Uh, definitely, uh, definitely improvisational. Uh, I'm certainly not copying uh, or, or using the actual uh, bush in front of me as a um, to count the branches. No way. It's going to be very improvisational, very interpretive, uh, sort of ad-libbing the whole thing using a paint that is down to an ink-like consistency, so that you can so that you can see how the brush is flowing. Uh, it becomes even more dense down here. It becomes almost like a thicket. Uh, uh, and that can be done more than likely in great detail uh, after you sign the painting and you go over it and you decide whether or not what, what else is needed. The, the thicket quality underneath here is probably what is what I'm talking about. It gets extremely dark, but I, but I really must get on to the shadow that this casts and it's all part of the um, of that, well, before I do that, let me put in a few of these uh, of the highlights of the branches that are close to you here. They, um, those, are, those are catching the sun and they are uh, vital to the third dimensional quality of this bush. They have, you have to be able to, along with the dark ones, you have to be able to see the light ones that are also uh, evident in, in small places. Uh, in order to do that, you have to prepare the background with the dark color first and apply the light ones uh, afterwards. Um, when I'm told that I, uh, that I make a lot of details very comprehensible, I'm hoping that this is one of the times that this is, that my technique of overlaying color is, um, is um, clear here. If it's not clear, then the message, of course, is, um, is absolutely pointless and the, uh, the time has been wasted. Now I'm coming to, I'm going to change a brush and I'm going to get to that very deep, 
tone that is on the beach. The beach is, um, this is a great deal of sun. As soon as a lot of sun is out, that means that you get a lot of uh, deep shadows. And um, the deep shadow underneath this bush on the beach is, um, is all sort of blends in with the darkness of the under part of this bush. As the, as the program winds up, I'll probably uh, be even concentrating even more on the darkness of all of this in the foreground here, which is then in, a, in its own turn, the beginning of preparing the, um, preparing the, uh, the uh, shadow part here to receive the light bright uh, weeds that are in the foreground. So here is a beach which we all know is is quite pale in color but underneath this bush it is extremely dark. Uh, another thing that's one of the things that I talked about when I was talking about a, painting a white church how the uh, shady side of the white church is actually extremely dark much darker than you would ever contemplate. So it's the preconceived idea that you're working on something something very pale, at this point, the beach, and um, it is, uh, in fact, almost as dark as the branches of the bush. So here is, a, here is the, uh, a sort of a thinking process that you have to go through uh, to be able to get to this point. Uh, the underpainter, I'm going to use the palette knife now because time is running out and I want to get the beach color on to show you how the contrast of, um, of uh, the uh, beach color, which down there is very close to white with only a slight touch of pinkish tone uh, in it, um, and it's, uh, it hugs the water. Uh, the, um, the, if you ever do go down there to uh, sort of play, play time at the beach, you had better take shoes. It's, um, it's full of sharp stuff, not only human uh, debris, such as broken bottles, but it's also, uh, it's also pebbles and, uh, and sharp, uh, sharp twigs and things and nasty cutting stuff. So here is, the, here is the pale quality of the beach, and here is the shadow uh, on the beach meaning that uh, the, uh, the understanding that things in shadow tend to be extremely dark. Something as light and sunlit as a beach becomes extremely dark, a uh, shadow underneath the bush. Repetition may be tiresome and maybe sometimes, uh, you know, maybe should not be inflicted upon you, but uh, from the comments that I get from the people who have been watching me, the, um, uh, the, boarding, the boring parts are hopefully minimal. Uh, here is the way one would handle. Oh, okay, uh, what, uh, over here I'm going to I'm going to apply a very thin film of this quick drying white because this is beach. Uh, even though it does not show what I'm doing, it still looks like the color of the canvas. Uh, I have to use the. Um, Use the background for my overlay technique of putting darkness in here. And there's a little bit of pale blue, interestingly enough, that is showing through. There must be some sort of water peeking through back there. And a little bit of pale blue uh, that is sneaking. Maybe, it's the, maybe there's a little bit of a puddle back here. But there is some blue shining through some of this very dark uh, beachy stuff. All right, the final, the final push towards making the, uh, the darkness of all of this growth here, uh, all mixed in with the darkness of the shadow of the bush, and it all sort of blends into one uh, very large, dark, and mysterious area. I'm using Van Dyke Brown, some ultramarine blue, and I'm going to um, just very interpretively show you how dense some of these shadows are. There's also a dense quality back here where this blue is showing through. And uh, this is all bushes and and uh, and growth and weeds and so on, which is uh, which makes for the the mystery of these places. Um, the uh, the details uh, sometimes uh, begin to look as though I'm sort of you know copping out on the details, but I want it to be painterly, and I don't want it to look as if it's as if it's. Uh, um, Sloppy. I have to make sure that, you, that, the, um, that the understanding is that I am observing all this as carefully as I possibly can. Here, in the, uh, here are some of the uh, little beach things that are growing uh, underneath this tree. They, uh, they, they, are, uh, they are grass, uh, beach grass weeds and so on, and little things that are popping up, and they are caught in the shadow, but they, and they become silhouettes. Uh, 
Now I'm going to just, as the, uh, as the time wears by and, and is going by very quickly, let me see, there are some, there are some sort of, there are some uh, cribbly things here on the beach. Uh, probably some uh, washed up flotsam and uh, some what you might call darkened uh, patterns of seaweed that have been washed up onto the beach here. The beach is not pristine white, it's got things on it. Uh, so uh, texture is, uh, is, is, is important and the, uh, the observation of, of the texture, what color it is, and why it's important to the composition. Well, with my trusty and uh, wonderfully uh, versatile uh, uh, weed brush, I think I'd better really get a lot of this darkness here in the foreground and, um, and trust to the fact that I will have the time to be able to show you how to do the, um, how to do the weeds in the, um, in the foreground. I'm going to, uh, I'm using the palette knife for, uh, which is in one of my very favorite uh, times when it when it behaves uh, you know, no way that a brush could ever possibly get this effect is when is when the palette knife becomes almost essential in my in my thinking of doing these wonderful weedy um, terrible places that uh, harbor uh, all of this uh, texture it's very much like um, it's very much like um, textile designing. So anyway, here in the foreground, and I'm using a little bit of oil to make this dry a little bit faster because transportation is, is important, those pale weeds will, be, uh, will come in here and um, be against this dark background. I'll do that in just a moment as soon as it's prepared. Uh, I hope that um, my panic to get this uh, done as much as possible has not translated itself into your being nervous for me. That can happen. Uh, very often does. People say, oh, she's getting so panic stricken. But I do, I do feel that um, an awful lot has to be accomplished uh, and a lot of information I would like to dispense uh, in these programs. Here we go. I'm going to um, remove as much of this dark paint from this uh, trusty brush and uh, put, put it into um, the oil, uh, the medium, and use probably an extremely uh, liquefied uh, amount of um, yellow-green as well as um, pure yellow for these weeds that are in the foreground. They, uh, they are on tall stems and a, and a sort of a nice uh, quick gesture for the stem is going to do maybe two or three and they are goldenrod by golly I did not realize that goldenrod was growing out there so profusely um, it does not bother me therefore I'm never concerned about the fact that there is goldenrod around a lot of people would probably run run at a clip uh, away from it but anyway this is the way you would put this these um, these weeds in the foreground in for final detail of the um, uh, and as you as I as I I'm demonstrating right now, all too clearly, that the last thing that you do is, of course, the foreground, the foreground stuff. A little bit of finger won't hurt any, a little bit of light on these weeds would be just, just fine. And that can be applied with a finger technique. Uh, anything that works is acceptable. These, um, these uh, little demonstrations that I uh, do, I expect you if, you, if you're observing and if you really want to try to do work in this general vein, that you will find they work for me, therefore they ought to work for you. Well, as usual, I'm about to say goodbye as I'm painting furiously to try and come to some conclusion. It was lovely. Thank you for watching. I enjoyed it. I hope you did. Uh, tune in whenever you can. If you have trouble finding me, find the program guide on channel 14. Bye-bye. <laughs>